Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the show. I want to uh, make this as streamlined as possible, so let's just jump right in. So today is the second day after we had that uh, nice little calamity, which was Cointelegraph, and they released uh, a little bit of fake news, which caused the market to pump. I got to tell you, the things that happened and uh, followed was really quite surprising to me. I didn't really think this would uh, actually come about. And uh, just so you know, I, I linked this in the description. I'm not going to play this video, but uh, this is one of the, I believe this is one of the head of uh, at Cointelegraph, where she talks about why this happened, how it happened, and of course, moving forward. It was a very, quite honestly, a bad response. She pretty much just says that uh, the reason that this happened is because they have such pressure to be first that they have to get all this information out, even if it's incorrect information. I'll have you listen to it, but uh, I don't believe this is how journalism should really go. I understand, you know, I am in this industry somewhat as I try to get the most information out first and foremost, but you have to really back it up with a little bit of, of uh, due diligence and move along from there. If I gave you guys every single rumor that uh, I heard on Twitter and all the different uh, chat groups, uh, it would be a real horror fest and I think everybody would be wrecked before uh, you, know, you could shake a stick at it. So uh, watch that video, I'm not gonna get into it. But the thing that surprised me from yesterday is of course we had the uh, rumor that uh, BlackRock, uh, the iShares, the spot ETF was approved and it was not, and we saw a massive spike. And after that spike uh, from yesterday, I thought myself, I'm like, well, this isn't gonna end well because people are gonna feel like they were bamboozled and hoodwinked and they were going to actually uh, sell off. Well, they did a little bit, but look at this. And uh, today, we're still at 28,556. I'm quite surprised. I'm actually quite surprised that people stuck into it, even though they said, well, you know, this was, this was a false story. So what it tells me is that there are people on the sidelines and they're waiting for whatever it is, whatever shoe to drop, whatever monstrous uh, problem that's going to happen in the Middle East, whatever great grand recession or depression is coming in. I think people are just waiting for this to go down so they can pick it up a little bit cheaply, but once that spot ETF rumor came out, they're like, holy smokes, I'm gonna miss the bus. And I think they, they got into it and now they're just kind of sticking around to see what actually happens. Now, I'm not gonna say that's like the best approach. I think some of the things is, and I can't give you financial advice, obviously I'm not a financial advisor, but I think one of the problems of investing is just staying out too long and just paralysis by analysis. And you're just waiting for that right opportunity to time the bottom perfectly or just somewhat 80% well. And you kind of miss your opportunity and then you're kind of just playing catch up. So I see this as, uh, as very positive. Also, I, I will say that uh, as far as like, I thought there was a massive amount of, uh, of actual volume as far as trading. But we take a look at uh, livecoinwatch.com. Uh, you can see that uh, trading yesterday it was around 30, 40 billion dollars. Actually, today's 30 billion. Yesterday was only well, 24. You would think that it would be a lot more for what happened, but of course, it was mostly just in Bitcoin. All it's also shot up, but uh, not a, 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 a massive amount. And if we go back, I mean, look, even on August 29th, we had, shoes, 20% uh, more roughly. We had roughly 41 billion dollars in volume. And then if we go back to July 14th, we had 47 billion and so on and so forth. So. I was a little bit uh, surprised on that as well. I thought there was going to be a heck of a lot more uh, volume, but uh, that is what we have. So when I take a look at all this, it really comes down to the fact of people are expecting, wanting, and needing this spot ETF. And um, I've had my position, and finally I've been backed up by Kathy Wood. Kathy Wood from Mark Investment came out yesterday. I think she was on Natalie Brunel's show, and she said, look, here's the problem with the spot ETF. And it is Gary Gensler. Here's what she says. She goes, for me, the disconnect is they, SEC staff, know a lot. And they are so good that I believe this was much more Gary Gensler standing in the way. And I didn't know that uh, you know, the different members of the SEC were this in depth with crypto, but it makes sense that they actually were. But the problem again is, this is my thesis, is just Gary standing in the way. I don't know for sure because they could never say anything, something like that. I just know from how we have discussed Bitcoin with them that they really understand it and they understand its merits. I got to tell you, probably the SEC is a, a lot farther ahead than people who are investing into Bitcoin right now. And of course, because people are investing into Bitcoin because of a lot of reasons. I think one of the main reasons people got into Bitcoin is because numbers go up. Let's be honest. 
And if the SEC understands it, that's better than the average investor. And now she, she continues on. She says, why he allowed a Bitcoin futures ETF, which involves counterparty risk and not a spot Bitcoin ETF, which does not involve counterparty risk. In fact, ours will be backed by Bitcoin one for one in cold storage at Coinbase. That's why Grayscale won its case. It's, it is that argument. And of course, if you're unfamiliar, if you do a spot Bitcoin ETF, you have to purchase the physical item of Bitcoin. With a futures ETF, that's all paper, that's all paper Bitcoin. They can run up the price, they can you know, short it, long it, whatever else, even the same thing, but you don't have to control or actually buy the underlying asset, it's all paper. So with this one, and I have to agree with her, it looks like there's less counterparty risk, but the SEC sees it differently and that's why, they, that's why Grayscale brought them to court and they actually won it. And of course, Grayscale now gets, to, gets that uh, ability to have SEC take a look at their uh, option again to convert their trust into a spot Bitcoin ETF. Okay. And then lastly, she says, I think Gary Gensler's personal Vietnam is coming around to haunt him. I do think the SEC is moving now. And yeah, I think the SEC is moving now. And again, the problem that I see with the SEC, this probably won't be popular opinion, but it's the truth, is Gary, Caroline, and Jaime. And you'll note that unfortunately, political parties are polarizing. Gary's a Democrat, Carolyn's a Democrat, Jaime's a Democrat. I, can, I can't guarantee, but I have a higher resolution and probability that if we had Hester Pierce and Mark Ueda and another Republican probably on there, I'm pretty sure, I'm guessing here, but I have again a higher probability that a spot ETF would probably be approved. Mostly because Hester Pierce is such a proponent for cryptocurrency and digital assets, more, more importantly, Bitcoin. But unfortunately, we have Gary. And the question always is, is who does Gary work for? Does Gary work for Goldman Sachs or BlackRock? Doesn't appear to be because it's been taking quite a bit of time and maybe it'll get approved, but uh, he works for the White House. And the White House, again, is not a fan of crypto, Bitcoin, digital assets. And it's not just the White House and the Biden administration, which are controlled by Democrats, which I have no problems with Democrats. I'm just saying that's just what the truth is. It's also we're fighting against senators like Elizabeth Warren, who never misses an opportunity to talk ill on Bitcoin and any digital asset. As she says here just a couple of days ago, uh, she called out that uh, crypto was being used for Hamas. And of course, those are the types of things that only Bitcoin users use and has nothing to do with the fact that most of it is used by dollars. But that's politics, my friends. And that's what it is. So on top of that, you have to understand that the people in power, they need to take all those funds, that's what quantitative easing was, and they need to take that back because that is a problem with inflation. And there is a problem in the US government and that problem is that they can't collect enough taxes. And because of that, they're gonna have people like Senator Elizabeth Warren and a lot of other Democrats, or excuse me, senators. And they're gonna call for an increase in tax reporting rules because they want that money back. The money that they gave you, they wanna squeeze you. And they need that, those funds back so they can reduce the amount of circulating supply, which is what they did in 2020 when they fired up the, the printers. And this all kind of comes down to this. They need this to happen so they can keep the dollar strong. The dollar has to be strong. And that's why the government doesn't want us using Bitcoin because it is a competitor to the dollar. It is a store of value, right? What else is a store of value? The dollar. And if we can take a look at the Dixie, which the Dixie is just, it's just a, a comparison of the US dollar against a, a basket of six currencies, uh, the Euro, the uh, Swiss franc, yen, and um, a couple, couple other ones I always forget. <laughs> the British pound and two more. But if we take a look at the, at, at the five-year DXY or Dixie, we can see that in all honesty, the dollar is very strong still and reached its peak in 2022, September 1st. And now it's still pretty well. It's going well, but we can see a problem with it on the horizon. And again, that's why the government doesn't want it. We can see that just a couple of days ago, treasury bond auction runs into weak demand. I mean, fears that soaring US debt will overwhelm Wall Street. 
Treasury bond auction saw a weak demand on Thursday. I think this was this is for the 30 year. Yeah, the U.S. sold 20 billion dollars of 30 year bonds, but dealers had to take up more supply after investors balked. They don't want that. They don't want that. Why would they want that if the government is taking out 51, roughly 51 trillion dollars in bonds? That's how much is is, is in the U.S. bond market. 51 trillion. You think China? You think China wants any, anything to do with, with Bitcoin and crypto and digital assets? Maybe they can control it a little bit, but look, they've got $3 trillion. And if you take a look at globally for bonds or total securities or the bond market itself, it's $133 trillion. Why would governments want to compete with that? And it can be laid out perfectly, and I link this in the description, from the last report, White House releases comprehensive framework for responsible developer of digital assets. You know what they're trying to do? If you just take a look at CBDCs, it's mentioned 16 times. What they're trying to do is stall, I believe, until they can rule out this US CBDC, but they don't understand the whole point of that. And this is, this is the problem that I think, I think people, they missed the forest for the trees, I guess. Which is they take a look at this and they think, okay, if we can just get a better payment system and use a CBDC, which we control, people will go for that. And I think as people get into it, as if they don't really know what, what Bitcoin can do and digital assets can do, I think they can. I think they see it like that. But when you peel back the layers and say, okay, hold on. The reason why we're in this, this mess right now is because the Treasury and the Fed, they printed too much money. Inflation went up enormously high. Now they're trying to do everything they possibly can to unwind everything and everything is in control of the government. And I think hopefully that, the, that people like you and I, we understand, but as time goes on, the people that get into this market, they'll only think about this as numbers go up first. So hopefully they can understand that this is not the way to do things. And hopefully the people that are out there right now, they're looking at this and saying, why did Bitcoin go up so much on this spot ETF news? They'll take a look and say, hold on, wait. The reason why this is going up so well is because it's, it's an asymmetrical bet. And if we compare, again, Bitcoin against everything else out there, as far as return on investments, I mean, it's crushing it. Real estate investment trust, bond market, stocks, gold, commodities, US cash, mid caps, large caps. We talked about this before, NASDAQ 100. And they take a look at this and they look, this is pretty good for 2023. Not so much for 2022, but going backwards and take, of course, annualize, it's 144% year over year. US NASDAQ, which was, you know, gold standard, I guess, 17%. Pretty good, but come on. Why aren't we allocating something into there? I know people will say, like, we talk a lot about the four-year cycle, and I still believe it's, as far as I know, it's still in play. Did we not have a, a halving in 2012? Halving? 2013 all-time high, 2014 a monster dip and a 2015 a reset, 2016 a halving, 2017 all-time high, 2018 a dip, and 2019 a reset, 2020 halving, 2021 all-time high, 2022 dip and a reset. What happens next year? It's a halving. I like the narrative. It's played out pretty well so far. I think it will again. I could be wrong, but I think as people get into it, Hopefully they can understand the four-year cycle and go, oh, okay, well, if we just, we know what's coming into these, these next sessions, it's not so scary because when you see 73%, 58%, and 65%, you're like, what the hell happened? I don't want to get into that. Oh yeah, four-year cycles. Okay, I remember that. So it makes sense. And all these things are not just being pushed out by, by just, you know, little people like us. I mean, this is the same reason why Larry Fink came out and talked about yesterday and talked about how Bitcoin is, a flight to quality. And I know we, we, you've heard about this, but I thought it was just a, a genius move for him to get out there in front of the cameras and say, look, yeah, it was, it was a rumor and that's, that's a problem. But in all honesty, look how well it did. He says, I can't talk about the specifics. I think it's just an example of the pent up interest in crypto. We're hearing from clients around the world that, that want this. Some of this rally is way beyond the rumor. I think the rally today is about a flight to quality with all the issues around Israel, global terrorism, and then more people are running into this. So when I take a look at this, and then of course, that's just one piece. And lastly, uh, net inflows. 
for the third consecutive week by Bitcoin. And don't, and I'm, I'm not going to discount just Bitcoin. There's also some alts that did pretty well. Bitcoin saw inflows of 16 million last week, pushing the year-to-date inflows of 260 million. Short Bitcoin funds also 1.7, not too many. But then also take a look at this. Solana investment products added 3.7 million to the 24 million in the prior week. And XRP funds also managed modest inflows of uh, half a million, the 25th consecutive week of positive inflows for the product. So look, I know there's a lot of things to be concerned with. There's a lot of different turmoil. I'm not the expert to talk about that, so I will not be talking about that. But I think in the long haul, I think we're in the right place at the right time. And that's it for today. So look, like today's video, give it a thumbs up, consider subscribing. Everything we talk about is time sensitive. Thanks so much. Appreciate you.